Hi, I'm John Asak, and I'm very pleased to welcome my good friend, Jeffrey Augustine. Hi, Jeffrey. Hey, John, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Likewise, doing great. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really good life after Scientology, I find. <laughs> Long after Scientology, in fact, for both of us. But um, So we, for months, have been saying that we'd, we'd have a conversation about Buddhism because we both have had an involvement with Buddhism and we both a little bit um, surprised on a spectrum to outraged at, at the statements that Aaron Hubbard made about Buddhism, claiming that um, Scientology was 20th century Buddhism. And right, yeah. he makes quite a lot of claims in um, the Phoenix lectures. I've got the lovely 1968 copy, which has got an image from the OT3 material. <laughs> which is supposed to force us to join Scientology any minute now. Um, and in here, he says, um, and, and of course, this is July 1954, and he would later claim that, that Scientology was totally his creation, and nobody else made any significant contribution. And here he says, for to say that out of whole cloth and with no background, a Westerner such as myself should suddenly develop all you need to know to do the things they were trying to do, meaning the Buddhists, the Hindus, and the Taoists, is an incredible and an unbelievable and an untrue statement. <laughs> so there you go. Um, he goes on to say, I think, by the way, that Gautama Shakyamuni, he actually has Sakyamuni, but never mind, probably had a better command of scientific methodology than any of your chairs of science in Western universities, which is an interesting statement. Um, and I, I think he was a very scientific sort of fellow, the Buddha. He, he had a very good analytical mind. Um, we then go on to, of the great body of work comprising the Veda, the Deantic and Buddhistic written tradition of 10,000 years. So he's shoved Buddhism. He keeps talking about Dhyana and suggesting that there's this old tradition, which is Dhyana, and that Buddhism just borrows from it, um, without getting into a conversation about the Upanishads and the forest sages. Um, and the meaning of dhyana, let's just say that that, that could be taken apart a little bit. Um, he says um, that um, the dhyana is what the Buddhists talk about and is their background. We first find this Buddha called actually Bodhi, and a Bodhi is one who has attained intellectual and ethical perfection by human means. This probably would be a Dianetic release. I think he later elsewhere says, suggests that um, the Buddha may have been up to the level of a clear or something. And finally, um, now we find, however, some of the things that were written by Gautama find them very significantly interesting to us, completely aside from Dhyana, which could be literally translated as Indian for Scientology. And I'd just like to point out that Gautama didn't write anything and that the sutras were committed to memory by Ananda, we are told. And then about 500 years after the Buddha, they're finally, they start to be written down. And so they, they exist in a fairly fragmented state to this day. But so there are his claims, it's 20, you know, Scientology is 20th century Buddhism. And just one little story there. Um, it's a chap called Brown McGee, who um, testified at the Clearwater hearings, having been involved, which was in 1982, having been involved for, I think, 24 years with Scientology. And he had left uh, disgusted to find that so many people at the top of the Scientology bridge were dying of cancer. And his own wife was diagnosed and they were sent off to, you know, some clinic in Mexico where the waiting room was packed with Scientology OTs. And in his testimony, he said that as a physicist, he knew that what Hubbard said about physics was nonsense, but he was fascinated by what he had to say about Buddhism. And I laughed out loud because as a Buddhist, I knew that what Hubbard was saying about Buddhism was nonsense, but I thought what he was saying about physics was really interesting. So yeah. there's our starting point. Yeah, that is very, that's very interesting. Um, my background is, you know, I, I spent uh, more than 20 years in Advaita Vedanta, which, which, uh, you know, I studied Buddhism formally as part of Avesha Vedanta, you know, the Pali Canon, and um, a, a lot of Eastern 
transcendental literature, a great deal of it. It's, it's very scholastic for people who've not been exposed to, to Buddhism or Vedanta or it, they're very scholastic. They're very academically demanding, I think would be fair to say. But you also, the, the, the meditative exercises, in my case, I've done a lot of yoga, been a lifelong practitioner. Um, these are very demanding physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And as a disclaimer, I'm not, I'm not an atheist. I'm not opposed to atheism. Because for me, atheism and theism are identities. They're not even part, part of a, I, I did self-publish a book called What Caused the Big Bang. Oh, it won't show. What Caused the Big Bang? And it's a cosmology based on my experience and some experiences I've had. Mm. So my whole life I've been involved in consciousness. I, I think that's a better word than spirituality. Mm, yeah, I do. So, the word spirituality to me is is really difficult. It has been for a long time. Whereas, as you say, consciousness, we, we have well, something that we can almost get hold of. Well, this consciousness, whatever it is altogether, we'll qualify it that way. Mm. Consciousness, whatever it is altogether. And um, here, here's where I'd like to start as a point, something I discuss in my book. Mm. Having grown up as a Christian, the fundamental divide in Christianity, which is dualistic, is spirit and matter. Yeah. So what I do in my book, just like uh, the word uh, space and time were compounded by Einstein into space time, yep. I compound the word spirit matter. The mm. so spirit matter, I refer to it as a construct in which you must have spirit and matter. Mm. Now that's the Western religious construct that you are a spirit in a physical body. So there's spirit and matter. Mm. And that spirit is superior to, to matter. That's kind of the basic. And, and really, if you think about spirit matter, spirit and matter as the construct around which all theistic religions are built and, and, and many other types of religion are built, that's a very Western model. Now let's switch to the East where we don't have a spirit metal, spirit and matter dualism. Oh, by the way, I wanted to add, L. Ron Hubbard, instead of talking about spirit and matter, he simply recast it in different language and he called it the That's theta nice. mess. Yeah, the theta mess theory. That's just a rip off of spirit and matter. And just to explain to any Dutch viewers, yeah. the word mest, in Scientology doesn't mean excrement, which is what it means in Dutch. It means matter, energy, space, and time. Yeah, Hub Hubbard, Hubbard created theta. That's his substitute word for spirit. And mest is his substitute word for matter. He calls it matter, energy, space, and time. So Hubbard is still built, Scientology is still erected upon the same ideological construct of spirit and matter it's just and he, he's talking about the conquest of matter by spirit and the scientology cross is meant to represent this yes uh, so he says though of course it's an Alistair crowley uh, crossed out cross in reality but but you know I yeah talk about that elsewhere i'm sure but but yeah, yeah the and, and it's matter by spirit where in the western tradition you have only leibniz who he talks about monads and the universe being made of little spiritual particles. And it's a very, I think of, it's not a thought that appeals to me, I must say, because it sounds too much like a world built of body thetans. But that, as you say, that's very unusual, that, that the tradition is very much this dualistic view of a separation of that which is spiritual and out of which we take the word consciousness and that which is, is solid and lumpy and made of made of atoms and you're proposing an integration of these two ideas but not in the same way that oh, no no I, I'm, I'm i'm only pointing out that the model of or the model or construct of spirit matter i'm pointing it out as a as a, uh, a construct mm -hmm. i'm talking about consciousness as something altogether different okay than the western construct of spirit and matter mm -hmm. And I'm pointing out that Scientology is built upon the construct of spirit and matter yeah. called theta, uh, theta mest. Yeah. Um, 
An interesting thing Hubbard said is that Scientology was the rediscovery of the human spirit, mm. which if you look at the history of religion, the human spirit had never been lost. Yes. It did not need to be rediscovered. What is interesting, John, in the history of religion, if you take the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, mm -hmm. Joseph Smith claims to have rediscovered the gospel. Mm -hmm. He said the gospel was lost, that Jesus taught, and he rediscovered it. Mm -hmm. So for Hubbard to say that he rediscovered the spirit is simply a technique or an artifice by which uh, someone like Hubbard or Joseph Smith can say that the original truth was lost and I rediscovered it. I remember reading when I first read, maybe it was um, in high school, we had a copy of Dianetics in the school library and I read it and it made no sense to me whatsoever. <laughs> and I thought, well, this guy's too smart for me because it said he was a nuclear physicist. I thought, well, we want to get older, I'll understand it. Mm. Um, so fortunately- You did understand it when you got older. <laughs> But I didn't know it at the time, but it was, <laughs> it didn't make sense to me. And when I got older, it still makes no sense to me. So it does make uh, no sense though. And that's what we realize as older people. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So we have spirit matter in the West hmm. and we have spirit matter in Scientology. Buddhism, we do not have spirit matter. We have something altogether different. And that would be let's simplify it. the central doctrine would be that there is no duality in mm. buddhism yeah non-duality is yeah non-duality mm. there is and i think we can use the word in buddhism without going into the formal uh, language of it we could use the word consciousness for because we're westerners correct yeah so briefly my understanding is through the meditative discipline through study through application and practice, you realize that the ego I, the I of self-reference, does not exist. It's an illusion. Yeah. And not that. Yeah. And in fact, all of all objects arising in the phenomenal world are illusion. Yeah. That there is one reality that's transcendental and non-self. And it's a very, for me, it's a very sophisticated understanding because it liberates you from having to be uh, an ego I. Mm. I mean, functionally, we say I, but that's, that's a reference. That you can be consciousness and you have this vast, for me, it's very liberating to have a vast expanse of consciousness available to you. And when things arise in consciousness, you realize that that's not you. You disidentify from them. And that is what we discussed in our previous conversation. In Buddhism, when things arise before you, you you're not attached to them. Yeah. Now, non-attachment, if you want to briefly explain that, that doctrine in Buddhism, what is non-attachment? So I want to go there with Scientology. The, the Buddhist said that you should have no attachment to dust. Um, and basically, that, that as the world is illusion, but our error is our attachment to this illusion, our belief that the illusion is real. And so by separating ourselves, by detaching ourselves from the, the world that arises, then we can um, perceive reality directly. Something like that. Yes, and, and, and so non-attachment, it doesn't mean that you're not a dynamic personality or presence in the world. Mm. It simply means that you're not what you see. You have to go beyond what you merely see or believe or think. You and have to. Yeah. On the end, yeah. you're not emotionally glued to all that's going on around you. You can be detached from what is 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 going on around you and have equanimity towards it which is what i hope to achieve out of scientology having come from a um a soto zen background hmm. a zen buddhist background i wanted to achieve emotional equanimity that was definitely my goal in scientology and it failed utterly you know it, yeah, yeah, equ equanimity um 
as a uh, as a state of mind in which you're you're you can be in the world without being affected by the world. That's been a goal of, of many religions, mm -hmm. um, you know, inner peace, tranquility. But yet we're we're in a very existential situation, which is what I like about Buddhism is that you can be existentially involved in the world without without being um, trapped by it. You can look at situations. For me, Buddhism is about inquiring into the essence of a thing. What is a thing really? Hmm. And I'll give you a practical example. I, I approach life as what are things really? I want to get at the essence of a thing. Hmm. And I did work in science for 30 years. Not, I'm not a PhD. I'm not a scientist. But I did work with technology and science. Photonics, especially light. Photonics, biophotonics. I was a sales engineer. I had to know a lot about physics mm. and engineering and the beauty of light and photonics. I wanted to know what they really were, which is what the study of physics will give you. It'll tell you what things, the nature of things. Yeah. And, and then you go into to quantum mechanics where you don't really know what anything <laughs> ultimately is. And that's the wonderful delight of science. Mm. And, it, and there's some parallels to Buddhism, which is why I think not everyone, but some scientists, Buddhism has an appeal because it's non-religious. Yeah. You're not caught in a duality. You're, you're looking at consciousness. Now, in Scientology, let's go back to Scientology. Let's not go back to Scientology, Jeffrey. Well, well no, just <laughs> let's not go back. Um, but going back to Scientology, you're referring back to it. It does, it, its relationship to the physical universe is very definite. The messed universe exists and is there to conquer. And in practical terms, you know, let, let, me, let me contrast two things. When I say that I want to inquire into what things are, the essence of things, a practical application of that would be when I made an inquiry into what is it to be a Scientologist? And Scientology's answer is anyone who reads studies and applies the teachings of Alan Hubbard. But I want to know what is it really to be Scientology? And that's where you have to sign the four contracts, you know, when you have to do life history, when you have to give up your rights, when you have to do all these confessional sex checks. So what Scientology says it is versus what it actually is, what its real form is. That's when I want to know what the real essence of a thing is. And years ago, I was really curious about what Scientology really is. Mm. Not what it says it is, but what does auditing really do? What is it really? And is there a, is there a finally, what is the summation of Scientology? So that's how I approach things through a Buddhist mindset or what are things really, not what they say they are. What are they really? How do you actually do it? What does it take? And that's just part of my practical nature. Being a, an engineering type, you have to actually do stuff. Like when you build a piece of medical equipment, you're on a team. Some of my clients built medical equipment. You actually have to do everything in the world actually has to be done. You actually have to do everything. If anything is going to get done, you actually have to do it. So what does that require? What is it really? So what is Scientology really? What is Buddhism really? These are the kinds of, of questions that intensely absorb me. In Scientology, my summary of Scientology, and I have a couple of different ways of looking at it, but one thing that I do not like about Scientology, it is the imposition of one's will upon everyone else. Yes. It's the will to power. It's the Nietzschean will to power or Aleister Crowley's do what they will. Mm -hmm. So it's a flagrant disregard for the laws, customs, culture of others. Yes. It's a trampling on others. It's force. It's power. It's, in, it's in fundamentally Scientology as a church, as an organization, it is imposing its will upon others mm -hmm. to the point where it could, if, if it could, it would dominate the world and crush the world and destroy it into an L. Ron Hubbard world. Yes, very much so, yeah. 
now when you when you look at buddha he was not out for world domination or power buddhism doesn't seek to dominate the world to crush it or to impose one's will on others so that's a very that's one of the key differences between you can be a buddhist and you can allow allow people to be who they are and be with them and you can peacefully coexist in the world in scientology you cannot peacefully coexist with the world yeah. at all in yeah. fact you have to be in a perpetual state of war against the world yeah. and probably it's most um vivid and and um objectionable demonstration is scientology's desire to destroy psychiatry that's fundamentally being at a state of war with the world. We're going to destroy psychiatry. And David Miscavige, I was at the 2007 uh, New Year's Eve event where he wanted to obliterate psychiatry. And he used the animated hand grenade, which raises an interesting question. In, in Buddhism, you're taught to have compassion for others. Yes. <laughs> so this is one of the problems in contrasting Scientology with Buddhism. When you deal with mental illness, if Scientology for, wants to destroy psychiatry, what happens to the mentally ill? Mm. Are they able to have any help without psychiatry or psychiatric medications? What help can they get, John? The type three handling. Where no, you, but I mean, what? what, what, that's, what? It. that's all that's ever been offered by Scientology as, as an answer to um, psychiatric illness. And it, it quite patently does not work. Um, no, and for our, our non-listener, uh, for our listeners who are not familiar, what is type three handling in Scientology? To, what is type three? What is the type three handling? Uh, the complexities of, of all these things. A potential trouble source, which is somebody who is connected to a suppressive person, an antisocial personality. Um, there are three types listed. And the third type is somebody who is basically reacting to all of the people around them as if those people were suppressive. And so that is, is psychosis. And so uh, rather than referring to psychosis, Scientologists talk, say that somebody is a type three. And it's the sort of insult that's often hurled at people such as you and I, because we disagree with Scientology, we're considered to be psychotic. Uh, we're also considered to be antisocial personalities. So we're psychopathic and psychotic because we disagree we we choose to uh, debate and discuss and talk about facts and information rather than simply um towing the line and and doing what what we're you know what is ordered by the founder of scientology so um and the, and the idea of type three handling is basically that you um isolate somebody so that they cannot communicate with anybody and they will get better and hubbard claimed that he had cured psychosis by locking one man up. Um, was it Bruce Welsh, I think his name was? He was on the ship, yeah. Yeah, on the ship. And this man, in fact, um, as soon as, as he'd calmed down a bit, and people do, you know, psychosis goes in waves, though Bruce Welsh doesn't appear to have been psychotic. Um, because I talked with Mike Rinder about him guarding the door to make sure that nobody could get in. And then I talked with Karen. And about the little notes that Hubbard was passing under the door to Bruce Welsh. But as soon as, and, and Welsh during that time ripped apart a steel bedstead and, and pushed it out through the porthole, he was very annoyed. His crime was that he'd said he wanted to kill Hubbard, apparently. And yeah. I then talked with somebody who was, it just, just happened in a very short period of time. I talked with somebody who was on course with him on Hubbard's ship, uh, the Apollo, who said he was a very mild mannered. And gentle person we then later found that i think he was canadian he went back home and he had a an ordinary sort of life but um the, this idea that some by taking this one person and allowing them to go through whatever it was they were experiencing and then offloading them as quickly as possible that somehow uh, that you know th there's no reason to have psychiatry anymore according to hubbard in his statement about this because now we can cure psychosis. There's no evidence beyond Hubbard's statement. There's no research. There's no scientific evaluation of any kind. And so destroying psychiatry, as you say, without having 
some way of dealing for dealing with people who are suffering from psychiatric illnesses it is is a despicable idea and some of the attacks upon psychiatry itself you know, i've known various psychiatrists who were harassed by scientology and you know one of the famous stories is is, is about um, LSD being put in the toothpaste of psychiatrists at a convention and I dismissed this as a fantasy until it was confirmed by somebody who was working alongside the woman who did it so uh, this kind of despicable be behavior because one has elected a group of people as enemies and as you say I remember years ago talking with Otto Rose who of course was one of only five people who trained through to the top of Scientology Bridge with Hubbard himself, was Hubbard's own auditor or counsellor. And he still believed in all of the teachings when I met him and interviewed him. I didn't. It was mm -hmm. done for me. But people can believe what they wish to believe. Um, and he's, he agreed with me on one fundamental point, which was that the element that was completely absent from Scientology was the element of compassion. And yeah, if you take that away, what do you actually have? You know, can you properly claim to be a religion? Can you properly claim to be ethical and benevolent when in fact your objective is the, the opposite of Buddhism, where Buddhism seeks to show that the self is an illusion? Scientology seeks to promote the self to narcissistic grandeur, to, a, you know, whereas you say that the, there will be the control of the will. You don't ask people what they want to do. You command them hypnotically to do what you want them to do. So there's no consideration for others. Well, let's go. Let's two points here. Uh, Buddhism teaches compassion. Scientology teaches fair game. Yeah. Harassment. Ethics. It teaches the crushing of people uh, to obey the intention uh, to obey command intention which just means hubbard's will or david and scavenge's will yeah so in buddhism where you're making an inquiry into the nature of existence compassion for all beings in scientology you're not making an inquiry into the nature of existence because hubbard has already told you what existence is and one thing i've said is that with believers, the minute you believe a religion, the search for truth ends, and then the obligation to obey begins. So yeah. there's no there's no search for truth. Hubbard's already told you what existence is altogether. Mm. And instead of this profound ignorance in which you're inquiring to see what existence is through the meditative discipline and even admitting your own ignorance of what things ultimately are, And having the experience of consciousness, Scientology tells you you are a Thetan and a body. Now, going back to self versus non-self, duality you know, versus non-duality, here's what struck me after, you know, here's what struck me about OT8. Is the highest level in Scientology? Yeah, yeah, yeah the, high, the highest level in Scientology, OT8. After you audit out your body things, you've solo audited them out and you seemingly have no more body things, you are only yourself. In Buddhism, you're not, you're non-self. Mm. You have that experience of yourself as consciousness prior to all things arising, your consciousness, whatever it is, but that's not a self, that's not an I, that's not an ego, it's not mind. It's a liberation and the ability to notice things, to have free attention, to notice things, and just notice whatever is arising and do not react to it. Yeah. That's the number one lesson of, of Buddhism I learned is do not react. Mm. Really observe and watch. And then you watch your own reactivity and you get separation from your own reactivity. Mm. And thereby you master, you master this mechanism. You see the mechanism of mind arising and you, you decouple from it. Mm -hmm. And in that way, that is consciousness, one demonstration of free consciousness. Yep. In Scientology, when you audit out all your OTAs, you're fundamentally yourself. Mm 
and that's why the the end phenomena or the stated goal of ot8 is i know who i am not i'm not my body thetans and i'm ready to find out who i am but you're still a thetan or a spirit or a self and eternally you would only ever be yourself you can't be liberated to be transcendental consciousness. You're always only yourself. And Hubbard, Hubbard was stuck. He said, the, you know, one of the fundamental problems is that Satan's, why do Satan's mock up? Or why do spirits make things up? And this is so much confusion. Look, in Buddhism, you would never audit body things. You wouldn't even bother with that construct. You would see that as mind on mind. I've always, in, in Buddhism, we, they talk about mind, if you will, as a, a, a system that patterns and traps. It's a mechanism in consciousness, right? And you transcend this mechanism of mind. To me, Scientology has always been mind trying to solve problems in mind. Mm. So mind creates this idea that there's body things and accepts it and you're using mind and a meter to try to obviate these objects in consciousness which you yourself have created yeah it it it, 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 it so it's tautological to that degree hmm. in buddhism when you notice objects arising in consciousness you don't audit them you notice them and let them pass hmm. there's terms in buddhism like mind weeds mind weather and I've often told people uh, about Buddhism, if you go outside and it's raining and it's clouding and storming, you don't have to do anything about it. You notice it, you act appropriately, you get an umbrella, rain gear, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't react to it. You can't make the weather go away. Mm -hmm. you, you would simply notice what weather was and, and you know, uh, act accordingly, be appropriate. If it was sunny and bright and hot outside, you someone, you know, you'd put sunscreen on, right? Stay hydrated. So in Buddhism, you 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 flow with the river, right? Yep. You don't fight existence itself. And in Scientology, you're fighting this metaphysical imaginary battle with body statements. Mm -hmm. So you've evolved in this mental struggle that Hubbard has given to you and said that is what the nature of reality is. And that's quite foreign to, to the Buddhist experience. Now, an interesting thing is Buddha had 14 questions he would not answer. And I wanted to play with those with you. Okay. Talk about it. Say if I'll answer them. Contrast that was Hubbard. Okay. Mm. These are questions Buddha wouldn't answer. They don't waste my time. We're not going to talk about it. Mm -hmm. He deemed it be to be non-essential. His first question, is the world eternal? Mm -hmm. he's, he's not going to answer it. What would Hubbard do with that question? Is the world eternal? What does Hubbard say? I, I think it is in, in the conception of Scientology, and it's seen as, as something to be conquered and ruled. Um, well, in my view, Hubbard said that time was created four quadrillion years ago in this universe. Mm -hmm. Now, Hubbard has a multi-universe. He allows a lot of other universes, right? One's the king before. Because in auditing, sometimes if you run into a problem, is it this universe or a prior universe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I distinguish in my work between infinity and eternity. I say that our universe is eternal in that, but I define eternity as the duration, the lifetime of our universe. Mm. So it's finite where, where there's, in, there's things that are infinite. <laughs> um, Hubbard said that our universe, the one we live in now is four quadrillion years old and it was mocked up by Thetans. Mm. And Buddha says, we're not even gonna wrestle with this, mm. whether the world is eternal or not, or both, or neither. Another question Buddha wouldn't answer is, is the world finite? How would Scientology answer that question? Is the world finite? Well, it- Start, change, stop, what? Yeah, the, the things come to an end. 
um, to a conclusion. And if the universe began four quadrillion years ago, then it will end at some point. Um, so, yeah, we, we get to the difficult, the difficult edge. And, and one can understand why the Buddha is not going to go down these routes, because the aim of Buddhism is um, realization, enlightenment, um, the entry into nirvana or nibbana. And these things are irrelevant to that. I mean, the Buddhist statement about the gods, that if the gods knew the way to enlightenment, they would no longer be in this universe. So don't listen to them. <laughs> um, they can't teach you anything because they don't know the, the route out. Yeah, it's interesting. Hubbard talks about um, don't waste your brief breath in this eternity. So he does allude to eternity. He also says that, and, and, and you know, in Scientology voodoo, one of the curses is, you, you know, when you die, you're going to die alone and in the dark. And then you're going to be a rock out in space for all eternity. That's one of their curses. You're going to be a rock in space, nothing. So Hubbard delved into metaphysics at the level of engrams, body thetans, things that are unique to Scientology, even though they may have had precursors. But Hubbard gets kind of muddy on time frames. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the funny things that, that uh, I spotted Hubbard doing early on when I started to examine Scientology and look into it metaphysically is Scientology began as Dianetics in 1950. May 9, 1950, Dianetics was launched. The book was launched. The, the, the center it, actually opened in April, and there were a couple of articles before that, but sure. you used the word. But. but let's just say 1950, Dianetics began, and then 54, it becomes Scientology. Uh, okay. 50, 52 at first. Well, correct. Yeah, but it, there's some legal corporate matters, but he does but use the word Scientology. He's given Dianetics back, and so introduced yeah. dynetics 55 so he's got it back again but yeah so yeah. so 52 it begins with but the point is dynetics scientology begins in 1950 yeah. it has a finite starting date in world history mm -hmm. hubbard loved to backdate checks because he was you know johnny come lately the new kid on the block on new age kind of stuff mm -hmm. he had to backdate his checks to make scientology appear that it's always had been around that it had always been around it had its roots in antiquity in dianetics you know he wrote it owes its to the thinking he makes this statement of what is it john about uh, the thinking men of fifty thousand years that's um fundamentals of thought yeah that um that this this is basically the 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 greatest breakthrough in the last 50,000 years. Why he yeah. dates it to then, I'm not really sure. But um. Well, yeah, yeah. Just, so Hubbard, Hubbard goes in his metaphysics, he, he gives Scientology, which began in 1950 in antiquity and claims it's always been around in one form or another. Mm -hmm. And he's been perfecting it. And um, he says this one is this, th his book was the summary of 50,000 years of thinking men. That's right. But if you look at written history, what does it go back? Eight or 10,000 years? And then there's prehistoric times where there was not a written history. So I always knew, like, well, where was the other 40,000 years? There's no written history of thinking men going back, uh, thinking people, um, back 50,000. So H Hubbard's real, sometimes he's just so completely bizarre with time because the age of our universe is not four quadrillion years. No. That's we can date it from the Big Bang. Um, billion. And if we look at his, his florid use of dates in uh, Scientology History of Man, um, the new editions, the dates have been changed because originally it started, this is a cold-blooded and factual account of your last 60 trillion years. Now I went over this, Mike Rinder and I had a, a good laugh yeah. at thing about History of Man. But in the text, and I, Mike couldn't believe it because I said, I've read it. I haven't read a Hubbard book since 1983. And I actually read a Hubbard book all the way through History Man. And I said it was really grueling because it doesn't make any sense. It's all over the place. But one of the things in it is it goes from 60 trillion to 70 trillion to 76 trillion along the way. 
and and yang that, that's quite a lot of time that yeah, you know, in the two weeks it took him to write this book, there's 16 trillion years that's sort of come and gone. He is not very scientific. He is not very precise in his observations. Well, I mean, one thing about Hubbard is his work is not internally coherent. No. When you look at philosophy, you want internal coherence. Does it hang together logically yeah. within a philosophy? He's not internally coherent. And uh, John Peeler, uh, former SEAL member, he was the chief dpts sir at gold base mm -hmm. pts sir so if you're a pts he would dpts mm -hmm. john peeler and i've said this many times he gave me the best explanation of scientology is scientology is whatever david miscavige says it is on any given day mm -hmm. so back to buddhism about the things that that uh this is an interesting question if you ask the Buddha, is the self identical with the body? This is a profound question. Mm -hmm. Or so it would seem, is the self identical with the body? Are you your body? Mm -hmm. Or are you a spirit in a body? Mm -hmm. Buddha wouldn't answer that question. And that's really interesting where Hubbard was very specific about your Thetan who goes through a series of bodies. You, change bodies like we change clothes every day. You know, we've been in bodies for four quadrillion years cycling through different doll bodies, electronic bodies, human bodies, bodies on other planets. So there's obsession with bodies where Buddha just doesn't want to go there. Are you a soul? Are you a spirit? In Christianity, it gets convoluted because they say there's the spirit in the body. And in some Protestant traditions, I can't speak to Catholicism because it's never in Catholic, but they say there's the soul and the soul is the middle ground between there's the spirit and the body and the soul is in the middle. It's the battleground where the devil battles out. Mm -hmm. It's really convoluted as when I was uh, Christian, I could never get my mind around how there's, I could get my mind around spirit and body, but I couldn't get my mind around the soul in the middle. Like is this battleground, this fusion of like, so, and like, I don't know, I just don't know how the heck that was supposed to work. No, so I just, no. it. I didn't even worry about it. Didn't even worry about it. it it's like the Trinity, hmm. you know, God being three in one, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, co equal, co eternal, co everything, but God's in charge with the Son. It's like, and the word Trinity nowhere appears in the Bible, hmm. nor does the word rapture. No. So, noter is the sinner's prayer. So, but I digress. Okay, now, um, they asked, does, does the uh, Buddha exist after death or not, or both or neither? Mm -hmm. So, they wanted to know, does the Buddha exist after death? And they talk about the Buddha nature, but the Buddha himself specifically, does he exist after death? He wouldn't have to answer that. Now, L. Ron Hubbard, if you were to ask a Scientologist, does L. Ron Hubbard exist after death? What would the answer be, in your opinion, Mr. Atak? Well, that, that he, he um, has, yes, he would, and yes, he does. And he's, he's gone on to scout other planets for us so that he can enslave the populations there as well. One, no, but seriously, John, L. Ron Hubbard said that he was going to go on to target two, that, that Earth is target one, and he was moving on to target two. Oh. Correct? Yes. Absolutely. He does he does exist. He does exist after death. And there's how many Scientologists I've heard I've read so many testimonies, talked to Scientologists who said, I felt like Ron was with me in the room, as if he has this omnipresent godlike beingness where he pervades the universe. So even though he's on target two, he's there with you when you're hearing him on the lectures. Yeah, incredible. So well, they, they attribute this omnipresence to him. Hmm. Now, now, switching, so anyway, these questions that Buddha wouldn't answer, L. Ron Hubbard would, and he would go on and on and on and on and on, and he might give one answer about it one day, one answer the next, right? And there's not a lot of, there's not always consistency with L. Ron Hubbard. There's usually inconsistency with L. Ron Hubbard. 
Yeah, well, that's hell of a hoax. Is hell of a, hell of a hoax is a poster on ex Scientology member board, and uh, his law is for for every thing Hubbard said, there's an equal and opposite thing he said. <laughs> so, so the things that uh, uh, there's things metaphysics that Buddhism does not involve itself with, nor does it care to, but the entirety of Scientology is metaphysical and it involves this self gaining power. And that includes imposing your will, one's will on body things to eradicate them, banish them, exercise them, make them go away. Mm -hmm. It's very self-involved. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do anything to actually help them, you know? <laughs> No, it makes no, you right. work. Leave me alone. They're, they're like little mosquitoes or gnats, you know. David Mayo once told Karen that he thought the longer you were on Silo and us, the worse off you became. Hmm. So that's David, interesting. David told me that from the day he saw OT3, which I think will have been aboard the ship because he was in the team that in Edinburgh that first sold OT3 to people, so this would be 1968. He told me that from the day that he saw that, he realized that Hubbard was mad and that his objective was to get people out of Scientology. I find that very difficult to understand because in 1986, when I met him in Palo Alto, he and Sarge Gabodi were still selling a version of OT3 to people. I couldn't understand how. He told me this in 2013, the last time I spoke to him. Um, there seemed to be quite a conflict there. But I think he understood that that this was crazy making material, and it, it well, indeed think, has made some people crazy. No doubt about that. A Satan can always change his or her mind, and um, you know that that's that's the subject for another time. But yeah, you can. <laughs> I, I've I've taught, I've interviewed former Scientologists like you, many 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 many, many who've gone back and forth on the matter. And it's, it's not, not all of them, but some people have been ambivalent where they think there's not body things, but then other times they think there, there might be something to it. So people, as they process, as they leave the church and process their experience, they can be of two minds. And that's very common. That's very common to go back and forth and wonder. I had a one fellow ask me once, do you think there's such a thing as permanent cult damage? And I looked at that, and I don't think there's any, any um, one right answer to that. It's, yeah. It varies with each person. Some people are profoundly damaged. Other people just pop out of it. Mm. Like Tori Chrisman, mm. she said for her, it was like the Truman Show. It just popped and she just shattered and she was out of it. Yeah. And I watched it on, on YouTube. It was amazing when Tori Magoo popped out. Mm. And other people have struggled with it for the rest of their lives because they were so badly damaged. Mm. So I don't know that there's an answer to that, and, but the right answer for them is to be compassionate and to, to be there for them, you know, as people go through their yes. cult recovery process, where they were, because some people were subjected to hellish nightmares, mm. absolutely hellish nightmares. Many people, yeah. And, other people had it less, had it less so. So we have to look at case by case and Scientologists. I mean, in nine, my nine years involvement, I was never traumatized. Yeah. That's it. Um, it that didn't happen. I, a lot of hypnotic procedures were run on me and I, I got euphoric, very good indicators uh, about that. But I came away without trauma and it was only, you know, so I stood up and I, I started saying, look, this, this is the truth about Scientology. This is what Hubbard himself says. And here are the contradictions. And this is what Scientology has actually done, what the Guardian's office has done. And I couldn't understand why so few people were willing to stand up. There were a lot of people who came and talked to me, but very few people went public. And at first I thought, well, it's because of the harassment that, that you get. Yeah. But later I started to realize it was because of the trauma that almost everybody I met had been abused and humiliated at some point. Yeah. Uh, and only those people who were categorized as celebrities, as I was, be, you know, not because I had money, but because I was an artist, a writer, a musician, 
um, we were treated in a different way. We weren't subjected to these things, but anybody that was on the staff, you know, the Karen told me this, this thing about overboarding, which I hadn't realized, you know, this when Hubbard was throwing people off the ship from sort of 25 feet up into the water with their ankles tied together and blindfolded because they'd been two minutes late for course or something. He's traumatizing people. And there's this one little detail that many people over the years hadn't told me. They, in Corfu, the, the ship was in harbour, and that meant that the other ships, all the ships, were discharging their human sewage into the water. So when you were dropped into the water, it wasn't the clear blue Mediterranean Sea that you were going into. And this, you know, that, that could have an effect on you. That could upset you a little bit. As you say, some people are very resilient, and other yeah. people, just a little scratch is, is going to be enough. So saying, can you... Is there, can there be permanent damage from, from a cult? Yes, there can. Will there be permanent damage? Probably not. You know, for most people, it's something that can be digested and become positive and useful in life to have had that experience. It can make people compassionate to realize how unpleasant they were in the past when they got caught up in this, when it was a matter of whether they were going to get their comforts or somebody else was, and they chose as Winston Smith does in 1984, do it to them, do it to them, don't do it to me. Um, and so th how somebody will react to, to something, you know, the extreme cases um, um, in um, Man's Search for Meaning, you, there's a story about a, a man who is uh, quadriplegic. He's had a, a car accident and he's talking to the author and the author is saying, this is terrible, this is devastating for your life. And he says, actually, I was a dreadful person before this happened to me. And I am not unhappy having arrived at this because I feel I've become a better person. So how somebody reacts even to a, a tragedy on that scale where you, you no longer have a functioning body, you, you can't move your limbs anymore. How somebody responds to it, how they digest an experience will vary from one person to the next. Tremendously. Yeah, it will. It will. Uh, Stephen Hawking certainly. Uh, yes. One of the most brilliant physicists in human history certainly dealt with his his disease. Motor neuron yeah. disease. Yeah, yeah in, a, in a remarkable way, and it didn't. He didn't let it crush him. So, so when you mention overboarding again, that's the the lack of compassion. That, that's the, one of the fundamental things that differentiates Scientology from Buddhism is there is no compassion. Sure. Money, slave labor, child labor, invalidation, humiliation, abuse, undue influence, coercion, covering up rapes, covering up pedophilia. You go down the list. Yeah. This is not Buddhism. And, and the thing that outrages me it's, it's, is when Hubbard actually floated the idea that he was the reincarnation of a Buddha. I find that so outrageous he, because L. Ron Hubbard saying that he's the reincarnation of the Buddha. I talked to a former Seer member who's published and I won't mention her name, but she worked on the project and they test marketed to see what the acceptance would be when Hubbard wrote him of Asia. It was clearly trying to say that he was the reincarnation of the Buddha or the Maitreya, the one that was promised to come. Yes. And they get this, um, they said there was a prophecy, and I haven't been able to find it. Hey, if you well, find it I, I, okay, when I first got involved with Scientology, because I didn't have a pound to buy a copy of Dianetics, and I'd gone to the center, I, I didn't have any money. I got my bus fare, my train fare there and back, that was it. And I just, well, you know, I'll come back tomorrow and, and pay it. And it's like, no, you're not, you're not having something for one pound from us. But they gave me two copies of Advance magazine, which were talking about, this is before Himavesha was released, which were talking about this idea of Scientology being Buddhism. And here was suddenly this prophecy, this idea that uh, Maitreya or Meteya the Buddha who is yet to be, who will lead all of humanity to Nirvana. 
uh, and that, that he would have red hair, he would be a Westerner, uh, and he would arise two and a half thousand years after the Buddha. So being the sort of person I am, I immediately wrote to the Pali Text Society in London, who had been translating the Buddhist text since the 19th century, and said, here, what do you think? And they came back and said, well, mm, there is a vague statement in the Book of the Great Decease, which is included in the Digha Nikaya, the long sutras of the Buddha, though, of course, it's about his death. So it's unreasonable to think that he wrote it, I think. Um, and in there, you have no, no redhead, no Westerner, no two and a half thousand years. They said there is a Tibetan folklore tale that says 25,000 years, somewhere around there. So right at the very start, I, I was given that. Years later, years later, I, I interviewed John Sanborn, who was the head of publications from 1954 to 1978. Every Hubbard book that was released during that time was edited, compiled indeed, by Sanborn. And he was given the Hymn of Asia when it was written in 1954, so around the time of the Phoenix Lectures, and he refused to publish it. That's why it wasn't published then, because it didn't read quite in quite the same way as the published edition. The published edition says, am I Maitreya? The original is, I am Maitreya. And mm. someone thought this was such a, you know, an outlandish thing to say. And it's a grand rambling piece of hallucinogenic prose. Yeah, and just for, for our, our uh, people who we may have skipped by, yeah. Owen Hubbard, put out a book, Hymn of Asia, in which he implies that he is the reincarnation of the Buddha. And Scientology has said that there was an ancient Buddhist prophecy that 2,500 years after Buddha died, there would appear in the West a red-headed man who was the reincarnation of the Buddha called the Maitreya. That's how specific it was. Now, what's interesting is 2,500 years ago, during the time of the Buddha, there was no West. There was no concept of the West. There was no East-West like we have now because they didn't even know America existed to have a West or Europe or whatever. So that was nonsense because you couldn't, you didn't have a concept of East-West. I mean, that just didn't exist. And um, so it's kind of absurd that they would, that they would make up this geographical blunder and then the specificity of he had to have red hair is completely ridiculous <laughs> because it's sort of like red hair and he would and uh so it's kind of really nuts hubbard but but that's so like hubbard to, to uh you know he 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 steals the cross of christianity and modifies it into the Crowleyan cross hubbard claimed that he found he was excavating somewhere in, I think, New Mexico, and he found a sunburst cross and that he modeled it on the sunburst cross. And quite by oh. chance, it's on the back of the tarot cards. Yeah, so come on, Hubbard. So Hubbard. But I mean, with him of Asia, with this, this um, very strange text, uh, if you see me dead, I shall then live forever, but you shall see a world in flames so deadly that not one shall live. So he is dead now. Um, <laughs> the, the, the whole idea of the Maitreya, whether he's a reincarnation of the Buddha or not, and that's a matter of interpretation, uh, because the Buddha cannot reincarnate because the Buddha has entered Nirvana. The Buddha is, there is no self called the Buddha anymore. Yeah. Maitreya is a future Buddha. The prophecy is very straightforward. He will lead all of humanity into Nirvana in his own lifetime. So he was not Maitreya. He's and, dead. Yeah, and then let's let's uh, finish up. Yeah. On one point we could pick we could pick up again later. To attain Nirvana in Buddhism, um, there is no Nirvana to be attained in Scientology. No. That's the another big argument to be made that Buddhism and Scientology are nothing alike. I know Scientologists like to glom onto the idea that they're Buddhists and better than Buddhists, 
but if you're a Scientologist listening, you're not, you're not a Buddha. You're not even close to being Buddhist. Yeah. And there's no nirvana in Scientology. There is OT8, where you simply know who you are not. You are not your body things. That's not nirvana. That's not an ecstatic spiritual realization that will get you anything. Because OT9 and 10 don't exist, they will not be released. And so what we, and we know that because Marty Rathbun told us that when they raided Pat Broker's place, there was no nine or 10. It's not there. So what you're left with is not Nirvana. You're left with ethics, knowledge reports, sect checking, obligation to donate for your next highest IS patron status disconnection you're asked to engage in a fair game um that's not nirvana in fact it's hell it's quite the opposite of nirvana you're left with being only yourself forever and you don't even know who you are so you're left with no certainty but rather you have ignorance i'm ready to find out who i am is not a statement of nirvana it's a statement that you're a self and you're ready to find out who you are except oops Hubbard died and there's no nine or ten to find out who you are mm. so you're left with this hellish existence a bardo you could say that what yep. scientology is is a bardo world it's a self-created self-perpetuating hell mm. within the church of scientology it is a bardo world it is a lower world it's a punishment and you're mocking it up or self-creating this and perpetuating it. Oh. And the only way to break it is to just leave that system. Oh. Because if you truly want to be self-determined, you would simply leave and find out what reality or consciousness is for yourself without Hubbard telling you what it is through a bridge structure. And those are just, you know, what we've gone through is some, I think some very vivid differentiations on why Scientology is not even close to being Buddhism at all not even close i can't find anything after my decades of study that even reasonably if i had to make a chart how is it buddhist i couldn't i i can't see any way in which it is buddhist and and there is i mean the one of the things when i, I came to to write the, the original version of let's sell these people a piece of blue sky I determined that I needed to state the cosmology of Scientology. And it quite surprised me to realize there's nowhere where this cosmology is simply stated. You have to pull pieces from all over the place, the axioms, the factors, various yeah. statements. One of the most important statements, I think, is found in the book, The Creation of Human Ability, in which he puts forward um, a series of processes that you are to undertake which are largely hypnotic visualizations and at these one route is called route two and you have a series of um, numbered processes r245 route two process 45 is quite famous because that's where he fired a colt revolver through the stage and said this is a process of exteriorization getting somebody outside of their body that is not this is frowned upon in in our time and the order to perform R245 on people was given by Hubbard, of course, through the 1960s, that Scientologists were told to go and kill opponents, um, particularly Kevin Victor Anderson in, in Victoria, who uh, had an inquiry. But at R247, so just two processes on from R245, you have a process called separateness. And this is the only place that I'm aware of, and, and if anybody watching or, or listening to this has more information, I'd, I'd be delighted to hear it but as far as i know the only place where hubbard in, in all these hundreds of lectures thousands of lectures all of these thousands of bulletins and what have you the only point where he he clarifies this one of the questions that the buddha probably wouldn't answer is this process separateness and he says that he has proved through this process that we are not one great mass of theta we are individuals perpetually for all time now thinking about how big the universe is and how many living beings there are in it and whether or not the giant clam, when it gives birth, and the giant clam is relevant to Scientology, let's face it, when it gives birth to two billion little egglets, do each of these, a spiritual being, and 
how fragmented the concept in Buddhism, the central concept, is that you will shed the self to enter nirvana. And the concept in Scientology is that you will always be a self. You are perpetually a self. The, what is, is called jivatman, the, the separated self. I do talk about it in Blue Sky. It is in there. Back, back in 1990, imagine. Back in another century. Um, so with R247, you have this, you are perpetually individual. When we talked off air about this uh, last week, you brought up something that I think is incredibly important about Scientology. One of the key principles of Scientology in the auditor's code, the counselor's code, is never evaluate for the pre-clear, for the person who is being audited. And of course, Scientology is nothing but an enormous and elaborate evaluation. When I yes. saw OT3 for the first time, I balked and said, why are you telling me what happened to me? I'm meant yeah. to be the discovering this and now you're spoon feeding me this this material this is absolutely contrary to my idea of what scientology is which is a, a rich discovery rather than and then of course you look back and you go well when when you had dianetics he told you all about engrams and the past track and the file clock and the the demon circuits and the valences all these things that would dissipate later you're not as in Buddhism, the idea of dhyana, the idea of seated meditation, charm, zen, dhyana, is that you will perceive this. You will experience this, as opposed to, I'm going to tell you what you're going to experience. Never evaluate for the pre -clear. And so you have this contradiction in Scientology, and this was the thing that it came through to me. Everything is a double bind. Everything is contradicted. You are self-determined as long as you do exactly what I say. Nobody else can discover that. Exactly. Yeah, you're self-determined as long as you do what I say. And that's not self-determination. No, really. Uh, going, going back to uh, uh, R247, Hubbard said the primary, th the primary error was that Thetans thought they were one. Mm. Yeah. So unlike other traditions where there's a, a final unity, uh, in Christianity, you are one in Christ, one with God. Yep. Hubbard disallows that type of unity mm. by saying the primary error was that Thetans thought they were one. Mm. So Hubbard criticizes individuation. Mm. And yet, contradictory, he said, you're only yourself. Mm. Thetans thought they were one is the primary error. You're only yourself. So the so the metaphysics are not clear and concise in Scientology. And part of that is because there's been no, um, in, in, in religions you have, you know, rabbinical scholars, you have the church fathers in Christianity doing the patrician citations, there's Aquinas, Augustine, go down the list. Um, and then you have the Buddhist scholars talking about it. So in, in traditionally in, in, in the history of religion, you have scholars talking about and elaborating upon the words of whether it's Christ, Buddha, or even the prophet Muhammad, yep. Muhammad, Hinduism. Scientology does not have apologetics, and it doesn't have scholars who can comment and expand upon what Hubbard said. Yeah. And so one thing I really like about, about Buddhism and Hinduism uh, Islam, Christianity, as you can read the scholars. There's a question. Some really good Islamic, when I was studying what Islam was, when I began to study what it was many years ago, because I wanted to know what it, what do cool. they believe? Yeah. I want to know for myself. And um, the benefit of so much good online religious scholarship from, from scholars who spent their life and, you know, grew up in the faith, even, even, uh, Mormon scholars, there's been some terrific scholarship um, about, about the faith. And that's one thing that's really lacking in Scientology. And not so, permitted. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's there, not there permitted. Is no conversation. There's verbal technology. You're not allowed to talk about this. Yeah. What I say is true. And, you know, what's true for you is true as long as it agrees with what I say. It, it, I mean, another baffling aspect of Scientology, we, we, something that I realized soon after I left was 
you if you sell people what they want to believe you know you are a super powerful being and you you did nasty things and that restricted your power and your willingness to but you are a god fundamentally and, and you can go out there and so you tell people what they want to believe and of course there are people who are going to buy into that ourselves to some extent included um because well, what a trap that would be to be god you know that's why i see god as an identity a created identity and I'm not, I'm not a theist or a non-theist, you know, I'm like I said, I go to consciousness and not these identities. And Scientology, if I can go on, B B Buddhism, you want to deconstruct identity or deconstruct ego hmm. to be free from it. Scientology is such a, a, is such a heavy, heavy identity to carry around with you. Hmm. It's such a heavy constructed identity. The sense of liberation I had when I left was incredible. It lasted for a year. You know, I just felt so good that I no longer had to think within those blinkers. I no longer had to make sense of all of these contradictions. I could go and read anything I wanted to, including books about the human brain, imagine. I could read anything I wanted to, and I could come to my own decisions about it. And I, the thing was that I hadn't felt, you know, it's like I hadn't realized that I was in a cage and then I wasn't and it, you know it was great and, and it, I, I was much happier when I left because it, Scientology particularly after OT3 which I did what, about a year and a half before I left 15 months before I left and I, I couldn't make sense of things after that. But you would, it, John that would make sense because the liberation from spiritual bondage in this case, the spiritual bondage of Scientology. And Hubbard is very much archetypally a Luciferian character who traps you in the underworld. As he He's himself a... admitted, of course, in the OT8 bulletin, you know, he, he thought, thought of himself as Lucifer, yeah. which well, well, the he, conversation he, he, I had with Karen last week, it, you know, that's a consistent thread throughout his life from the age of 16, when he first read Alistair Crowley and fell in love with this very simplistic view of the universe that Crowley puts forward. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, so you were liberated from the bondage of Scientology, and of course you're going to experience enormous relief because you're not in that form of bondage, that mental bondage to L. Ron Hubbard, the bondage to an organization. I find the statement I must be a Scientologist in good standing with the Church of Scientology. That is such profound spiritual bondage to think that you have to be in good standing with an organization because an organization cannot, does not control infinity, consciousness or anything. An organization is a corporation with a set of rules. And it, it's just so antithetical to the idea of consciousness, liberation, equanimity, to have to be in spiritual bondage to an organization. To the, in fact, I love the saying, I think it was a 12th century monk, if you see the Buddha in the road, kill him. Yeah. And that was a radical way of saying, Buddha is not a God, he's not a, a, a figure to be deified or obeyed. If, he, if Buddha, if your concept of Buddha becomes bondage, kill it. So to Scientologists listening, if you see L. Ron Hubbard, if you see L. Ron Hubbard in the road, kill him. If you want to go free of Scientology, you have to do that radical act of leaving the church and write out a formal written resignation to RC, RTC and CSI. If you've been following us on Tony Ortega's blog, you need to formally resign. That's a different issue we can talk about later, how to legally resign from the church. I did on the 18th of October, 1983. Yeah, and I, I, think, this, I think we brought up some good contrast, John. I'd like to continue it, maybe with uh, talking about Scientology and its relationship to other you know, spiritual traditions. But it's been very interesting. Yeah. Um, it's been very interesting. And I mean, there's a point, to round, yeah. a point to round this up that, um, I have a friend who um, he told me that he he'd read that sell these people a piece of blue sky and stayed in Scientology. Now, over the years, I've met many people. Many people have come to me and said I left 
because of you know skip press for example publicly sort of said i left because john met my wife in la and she had me read his book and i i couldn't do anything but leave it it you know and that's my experience i've even i've had somebody who was a senior executive in the office of special affairs who had read the book and came to harass me and ended up saying i can't i can't deny anything you say in that book um Stacey Young, who, who wrote The Dead Agent, the discrediting pack on uh, Bent Corridon's um, Elrond Hubbard, Messiah or Madman, said that she'd read Blue Sky and she couldn't find anything to get hold of. But this guy told me he'd read the book and he'd stayed in. And I said, how could you do that? Why would you do that? And he said, they told me I would lose my immortality if I left. And of course, there's an Aaron Hubbard statement about how ridiculous it is to suggest that you can take away somebody's immortality. Well, but how could a corporation, how could a corporation own immortality? That's absurd on its face. Look, your book, uh, that's all these people, a piece of blue sky is so fundamentally important. And it is, it is very, when I first read it, I was blown away at the, your, your scholarship was so impressive. Like, and that was pre-internet days where you actually had to travel around and do the work. And I go did. Yeah. Bike and, I mean, thinking, man, this, this guy did a lot of work. I was very impressed. And it confirmed some of the things I had thought, but I didn't have evidence for, and the book presents evidence for. I think it's important, um, if you're really seeking spiritual freedom to read widely, to realize that a corporation cannot control, own, or guarantee any entrance into infinity or eternity, or it's ridiculous to say that a corporation owns or owns or owns or controls your immortality or eternity. That is just ridiculous on its face. How could a corporation, the the RTC, CSI, CST configuration, which began in the late eighties, that's absurd. It's just that it's just. It doesn't even take very much thinking to say that a corporation controls uh, eternity. When did eternity license it? Who in eternity would do it? How could that even happen? It does sound, sound like an Elrond Hubbard science fiction story, you know? Sound, it it sound like an Elrond Hubbard science fiction story. Well, you know, these, these when you when you start believing and you buy the program as a believer and you go all over board, then you'll believe it, right? When I was in church, I thought if I left Christianity, I would go to hell. Mm -hmm. Then I realized hell was a ridiculous notion and that the Christian God wanted me to suffer in conscious eternal torment forever, and ever, 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 and everyone else to suffer in hell. And that's not the kind of God I wanted to have anything to do with. That's why I, at 13, I walked away from Christianity because yeah. the simple question that I asked the, the uh, Methodist religious instruction teacher, religious instructor, I, I said, did he believe that God could ever forgive the devil? Hmm. The question just popped up in my mind. I hadn't been pondering Good it. Question. Yeah. And he said, no, and I, that was it. The switch switched and I was, well, I don't want, you know, I don't necessarily not believe in God, but I don't believe in the God that you're seeing. And because yeah. I had a, a friend, um, Mitch Beady, who was a good friend of mine, and he put forward, very clever guy, put forward this idea, he said, well, how could anybody be happy in heaven knowing that there were others suffering in hell? Yeah, I had that thought too, yeah. Yeah, and so I've, I've had a Christian tell me that your memory is of, of these other people is wiped. It's sort of, I'm still not with your God, you know, this, and yeah, all of the vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and all evil comes from the Lord. That's quite an interesting Old Testament statement. Yeah. All evil comes well, from the Lord. The idea, the notion of God, the loving God, is, is quite distinct. And you and I have spent a lot of time studying the history of religion and people like Machia Eliadi and Joseph Campbell, who dug into this material and start showing you how the stories change. Yeah. The narrative is made better and better or, or worse and worse, depending on whether you want to punish people with you know, brimstone and treacle or, or whether you want to uh, make people feel better. But so many of these stories, they become fascinating. And as Campbell said, um, mythology is, is not history, it's psychology. Yeah, um, that's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of 
there's such great wisdom when he said that. And um, so I think I think the summary is, you know, like I said, there's nothing Buddhist about Scientology. I think you could summarize it in a nutshell. This the lack of compassion alone disqualifies it as such. Scientology's um, leaving you finally as yourself alone. And there's no liberation, no set, no nirvana. Hmm. So what do you finally attain in Scientology except you know who you're not? Hmm. What does it mean that you're not your body things? If that's all there is, then you might as well leave hmm. and go look for something somewhere else. That's how I would conclude the matter. And let me add to this something that is fundamental to Scientology that many Scientologists may not realize. In 19, February 1938, Aaron Hubbard had um, surgery to remove wisdom teeth. He was given nitrous oxide. I later found out about the nitrous oxide cults of the 19th century, mm. which many intellectuals belong to. Uh, Rajneesh, of course, was very keen on nitrous oxide, had it daily. But Hubbard had an experience which he talks about, and he says that, that he was dead for eight minutes. And during that time, he saw a smorgasbord, that's the last Swedish word for a buffet, a smorgasbord of knowledge. And he's then suddenly told, no, it's not his time yet. He shouldn't have seen these things. And that becomes the origin of Scientology. But what he is trying to do at that point, and from that point onwards, he felt that he had left his body. He had an out-of-body experience. Scientology is totally an attempt to create the, the ability, the willful ability to leave, separate from your body, to be three feet back of your head, to be exterior, to be outside the body. It is Hubbard desperately trying to achieve this. On the, the ship, the Apollo, there was Mary Sue Hubbard, his wife, would often have screaming matches with Ron Hubbard. She was generally yeah. very devoted to him, but she'd get very upset. And one day it erupted and she said, you're a charlatan. You're a charlatan. And he shouted back for a while. And then he said, well, what can I do to prove that I'm genuine? And she said, I have never been exterior. I want to go exterior. So this is the, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the controller of the Guardian's office, the second deputy, the first deputy commodore, um, so the second highest person in Scientology saying, it doesn't work. And Hubbard then assigned Otto Rose to use every exteriorization process he'd ever put forward until eventually Mary Sue Hubbard went exterior and fulfilled the promise that Scientology had been making since 1952. And eventually, completely exhausted after several weeks, Mary Sue Hubbard said, it's all right, I can't take any more. And that is you know, the end phenomenon of Scientology, that point where it doesn't work. It doesn't fulfill any of its promises. It isn't Buddhism. It isn't. If it's a religion, it's a religion in the same way that the Thuggies or the Aztecs were religions, things that you know, leached away yeah. the lifeblood of people. You know, to be a religion is not necessarily a positive thing. No, and John, what, you know, this whole idea, just to, to conclude with that, in Buddhism, going exterior or not, it's it's not it's, it's, completely, it's completely unimportant. You can have mystical. There are mystical experiences people have had in Buddhism, very transformative yeah. mystical experiences, but they're not to be clung onto or sought. Hmm. The very last thing you go for in Buddhism is exteriorization. It's unimportant. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. You don't attribute anything to it. Yeah. And so that, that, I think, is a very good point to end on. Exteriorization in and of itself doesn't mean anything. If you had a sense of leaving the body, good. But if, if you don't, you don't. Most people don't. Whatever out-of-body experiences are, they're nothing in Buddhism you would seek or go out of your way for. So if you're trying to have an out-of-body experience, that's something you, as a, from a Buddhist perspective, you would look at that. You're trying to have an out-of-body experience. But what does that mean and what would it get you? 
even if you had one, you would come back into the body. So what, if you're just seeking out a body experience, is Scientology finally a cult in which you're seeking to have an out of body experience? That's not meaningful mm -hmm. within the search for consciousness for nirvana. No, it is meaningful, however, if you're a criminal and your obsession is seeking to escape from prosecution and conviction. And we do know that that was a fundamental drive for Ron Hubbard to, to not be caught. And in the end, he just about got away with that. <laughs> yeah, if Sarge had used 120 volts on that special meter, mm. you would have won exterior fast. <laughs> so that's my gallows humor there. It's been grand good fun. So uh, let's um, leave the children at home with the thought that if they have any comments or questions, we'd be glad to field them. And um, please do what the chap says after the, the end of the video and, and share and like and do all of that stuff because it really helps. And um, thank you very much for spending your time with us. And thank, thank you so much, Jeffrey. Oh, John, it's always a pleasure to chat with you. Look forward to it. Great, me too. Cheer bye. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like as well as subscribe and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. We can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much. Let's not go back to Scientology, Jeffrey. Well, well no, just <laughs> let's not go back. <laughs>